Weighted average cost of capital, also known as WAC, and I said I was gonna use WAC from now on. I just wanna say it one more time for those who were not paying attention to the previous video. But weighted average cost capital, WAC, has two different parts in it. The first part is the cost of equity. The second part is the cost of debt. If you remember all the way back in the balance sheet, the balance sheet showed you what you owned and how you paid for it. Now there's two ways to pay for things, liabilities and equities. Now that rule in the world has not changed whatsoever. There are still two different ways to pay for things, liabilities, AKA debt and equities. That's exactly what makes up the weighted average cost of capital. See, capital is just where you got your money. And since there's only two ways to do it, equity and debt, those are the two aspects that go into WAC. With that in mind, we're gonna dive into the exact way to calculate the cost of equity and the cost of debt using obviously examples along the way. So let's dive into the more complicated one first, which is the cost of equity. So the cost of equity for a company is determined through something that's called CAPM. CAPM is just an abbreviation for the Capital Asset Pricing Model. CAPM obviously is way more fun to say, so we're gonna continue down with CAPM. CAPM is a financial theory that has been proven long withstanding to be one of the best and easiest ways for people to estimate the cost of equity. Now, I know a few of you guys are saying, well, cost of equity sounds a little weird. You say that equity is just investment from outsiders. That doesn't cost us anything, like a little bit of the company, but like, what does that mean? Well, see, what it really means is that the cost of equity is the expected return our investors are looking for. And that says that, hey, if they gave us money, and they know this about our company, what return do they expect? And then we need to take that in consideration when we discount our investment opportunities, which is what we're gonna eventually do with WAC. For right now though, we're gonna dive into CAPM. You see, CAPM is just an equation. The equation is actually not too complicated either once you understand what the variables mean. You see, CAPM is just the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. Now, if you've never heard those words before, that's okay too. You see, they're actually not that complicated. We just have to explain them a little bit. So let's dive into the first one. Risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is the rate that is pretty much paid on money that you know is gonna get paid back no matter what. And so usually a lot of companies will use the US Treasury bonds, which is just the loans that the US government takes from outsiders as the risk-free rate. The US government's not gonna go bankrupt. And because of that, it's risk-free. Since it's risk-free, how much money the government is paying people to give them money is the risk-free rate. The long-term average has been right around 4.5%. However, when we're filming this right now in 2020, it's actually down to 0.72%, which is super, super low. Anytime you hear about government interest rates and things like that, they're usually talking about these kind of treasury rates. And these treasury rates are what a lot of people consider risk-free rates. So for all of our calculations, we're gonna to refer to treasury rates when it comes down to risk-free rates. All you have to understand is that it's the least risky interest rate you could possibly find in the market, usually through the US government or some very, very large institution like the US government. Now, beta is just a really fancy way of saying, how risky is this company compared to the overall stock market? And you see, betas that equal one mean that they are just as risky as the stock market. Betas less than one are less risky. Betas more than one are more risky. So if you have a very small, weird, kind of niche company that isn't like the rest of the stock market, it might have a high beta because it's risky. If you have a large old company that has made a lot of stuff, has a lot of different companies, portions of it, is, is just a massive conglomerate, that actually might have a low beta because it just seems to be less risky. So beta is just a very fancy way of saying how risky is this compared to the stock market? You can think of it as a ratio of like one to one or 0.5 to one or two to one things like that. It's really not too hard of a topic. And actually to find a lot of betas, you have to Google it anyway. Yes, you can calculate it, but it's not any fun and you don't really wanna do it. You especially don't wanna do it by hand. Luckily for us, if you just type in what is the beta for blank industry, NYU has a huge database that they actually refer to, all kept by this one professor. He's fantastic. All you have to do is just Google, okay, what is the beta for the entertainment industry? And then of course it'll pop up on his website. You scroll down to entertainment and you can see the exact beta that it's going on right now in today's world. You see, you always wanna use the most updated beta, not the long-term average. See, the updated beta takes into consideration things like recessions, uh, pandemics, terrorist attacks, just bad supplier relations, all that kind of good stuff. If you look at old betas, 
the old beta for the automotive industry might be a lot lower than it is nowadays with electric cars and autonomous driving. So always take the most updated beta when you're doing these calculations. And just remember, beta is just a fancy way of saying how risky is this industry or stock compared to the overall stock market or economy in general.